Namaskaram, how are you all doing? Yeah. Namaskaram. We are excited to have your audience. Very tough time for all the doctors. Hmm? <laughs> I'm Professor Akshay Anand, I'm a neuroscientist. Namaskaram. Namaskaram. Uh, we have a journal, Integrative Medicine Case Reports, which is edited at PGI Chandigarh. Some of my colleagues are the editorial board members. And uh, beyond that, we have two physicians with us, uh, one public health professor and uh, two of us as scientists. Uh, we are glad that we are able to have a discussion with you on these uh, All of you are very highly qualified people. Why are you speaking to an ignorant person like me? Because we are in a very special situation, which is very complex. And we believe that it requires some mind-body massage. <laughs> because we at PGI, one of the largest uh, medical institute in northwest of India, cater to about 150,000 patients, publish about 100 research papers every year. And most of them are super specialists. And uh, under the guidance and leadership of our director, Professor Jagat Ram, we have identified a block completely dedicated to COVID. It's the COVID block. The OPDs are closed and there is an extended lockdown. Despite our best expertise and all the resources at our hand, there is something where we need your guidance and your spiritual blessings. I will now uh, introduce to you Professor Ashish Bhalla, who is a professor of medicine at our institute. Incidentally, he is uh, Sadhguru also our COVID chairman. Namaskar. Namaskar. The COVID uh, logistics and medical care and everything. I will invite him to uh, take the blessings and uh, guidance on a few questions he may have. Dr. Namaskar, Sadhguru Ji. Namaskar. Uh, sir, I, uh, as you know that we are going through a very tough time in this pandemic, uh, everyone is scared. Even all the healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses are scared. This is the fear of the unknown. What will happen to me? Uh, in this time, when you have this fear of the unknown, how do we deal with this fear of the unknown? And how do we keep our morale high? If you can guide us on this. My namaskaram to all of you. Uh, well, as you said, these are definitely challenging times. As a generation of people, uh, we've never faced a situation like this. The many manifestations of what could happen out of this, how our lives could change, whether uh, all of us will stay alive by the end of this year or not, all of this has become a question, particularly in the minds of uh, healthcare workers because you're continuously exposed to this. So one most important thing is, uh, we are still waiting for… Uh, I know there some things are being done, but this must be done at a war footing, because this is a kind of war. This is more than a war. The wars are usually fought at the borders of a nation. This is a war that is fought at uh, every individual level. Never before such a war has happened in this country. So, having said that, this handling it at war footing means, I'm sure, I'm sure if you give samples of uh, these protective gear that is most vital for the healthcare workers, uh, any number of innovations can be locally made to protect the people. And uh, this has to be done, I'm sure efforts are being made, but I feel I've been uh, urging uh, private industries and others to take it up by themselves and uh, produce these things at a very large scale so that uh, one who goes out to serve other people is never at risk. This has to be done. Well, in the initial uh, few weeks, uh, we have struggled because 
nobody really thought of the scale of what will be needed. Fortunately, because of the lockdown, the scale has been contained. We must clearly understand we have only contained the virus, not conquered the virus. In no way have we conquered the virus. We've just contained it with social distancing and lockdown, forced lockdown really. Well, uh, I would say it is… Uh, in India it is a success that way because for the density of the population that we have, by now it could have gone totally out of control. It is not… fatalities are increasing, but still for the density of population we have, this is not very bad yet. But the moment lockdown begins to relax, uh, how it will go, what challenges the medical uh, infrastructure in the country will face is a very… Uh, you know, uh, it's a very dire situation. So the most important thing to keep the medical personnel active and inspired is they must be well protected, their families must be well protected. This is an absolute necessity uh, that the government should take up, private industries must take up, everybody who is capable in some way to contribute to this must happen. Well, I think that is where the fear originates. May I uh, now introduce to you uh, Sadhguru, uh, Professor of Psychiatry, Dr. Sandeep Grover. He is also an ICMR awardee and well published. He had a, a couple of questions, but he'll ask you the first question and uh, maybe we can go to him the second question later. This is, a, this is the first time I am being questioned by a psychiatrist. <laughs> It's my pleasure, sir. Uh, what we are seeing at this moment that there is a lot of stigma attached to the COVID-19 infection. And when people are dealing, those people who are dealing as first-line uh, healthcare workers, they are themselves being stigmatized by their colleagues who are working away from the COVID-19 patients. So how do we address this issue of stigma for the healthcare workers, which they are facing in the hand of their own colleagues and in general public because we have heard the stories of doctors being not allowed to stay in the, as uh, tenants in the homes or they have been uh, thrashed by people in their neighborhood. So how do we deal with that? Well, uh, uh, it is not a question of stigma as uh, the first question came, it is more about fear. People are afraid that they may get it, people are afraid their families may get it, especially those who have uh, senior citizens in their homes in the form of parents, grandparents, they're very afraid to come near anybody who could be a possible infection. So let us not… It ne let us not call it as uh, stigma or discrimination. It is more uh, fear of being infected. I feel that is a good thing that people are afraid of being infected so that they will maintain the distance. So this is also important among the medical community, as you said, the colleagues, and the neighbors and uh, those who reside with you, they need to be educated. But anyway, one thing we need to understand is, for the, f for the first time in my lifetime, I'm seeing the level of regard and respect and appreciation that people have for the medical frater fraternity has never been as great as it is now. So let us not take a few cases of prejudice and uh, stigmatization that has happened and a little bit of violence also that happened unfortunately has been largely uh, put down. I would say never before have people looked at medical personnel, doctors and nurses with the level of respect and uh, appreciation that is happening right now. Any human being who puts his own life out to serve another life becomes worship worthy and that is what is happening right now. Let us not… Uh, uh, you know, demoralize ourselves with a few incidents that happen in the country. Thank you, uh, Sadhguru. That was very nicely put, uh, putting into the context and basically reassuring that the exceptions do not prove the rule. Uh, we should not generalize it. Uh, we'll now move to uh, Professor Sonu Goyal, uh, Sadhguru. Professor Sonu Goel uh, works on tobacco control. He's a professor of uh, public health and a lot of preventive work, what is happening, what are the trends. We discuss about the flattening of curve. Those are the kind of uh, areas that he interfaces with. Uh, Dr. Sonu, please ask your question to Sadhguru. Namaskar, Sadhguru Ji. Namaskar. Uh, it's a fortunate situation for me actually to talk to you and ask question uh, at this moment of hour. 
and uh, I am professor of public health and involved in uh, contact tracing and providing education to the community as well as covid patients and the health care givers in my institute so my uh, uh, my question is in continuation with dr ashish bhalla uh, which asked about fear and dr ashish uh, dr grover which asked about uh, stigma uh, so in these challenging times the health worker uh, during my interaction with various health workers of my institute and uh, even in chandigarh punjab i, I found that uh, the health worker has to perform two type of duties one his professional duty of taking care of corona patients and the second a family duty of reaching home safe and taking care of the family so in this situation which is challenging which you should think is more important and kindly resolve this ethical dilemma which is always preoccupied in the mind of uh, all all health workers like us <sighs> right now uh, i would say at this stage of this development of this virus situation in the country it is more a kind of a, a a social phenomena rather than a medical phenomena once the numbers increase in a big way then it becomes a real medical phenomena i want the medical fraternity to gear themselves up for that right now the load on the doctors and what is demanded of them has not reached its peak still it is a social thing socially we can manage this that's where it is right now but inevitably as the lockdown cannot continue forever as it relaxes then it will fall in your lap so you must keep yourself very balanced and strong and above all you must understand what you are trained for professionally this is most important right now for this generation of people this is a generational challenge whether we will come out of this successfully or we will be a disaster this is something we can decide by how we act and a large part of that capability is in your hands as doctors and nurses and the other staff which uh, works with you so at this time let us not think in terms of uh, which one should i do more family or this family which should be well provided for definitely i think i'm sorry if i say something that hurts all of you but i think probably it is best that none of you go home for the next two months really if you are concerned about your family that is the best thing to do because this is going to spread in such a way that we will be putting everybody to risk so it is important medical personnel have the necessary protective gear absolute protective gear and their families are protected from themselves because we do not know in what form because people are saying they are cleaning everything they are changing their gear but they are going with the same shoes they are saying hospital floor is the worst place when there are covid patients and uh, it could go with your shoes it could go in some way it is very important that your families are uh, protected from you your loved one should not be affected by your uh, profession and this is a profession which is sacred most of the time in normal times people may not realize this is the time everybody is realizing this how important this medical training is in a society this is the time the whole society as a nation as a world we are realizing how important it is so at this time do not create doubts in your mind how significant is your profession it's absolutely significant this is a generational challenge we must come out of this in a positive and successful way this if we conduct if the society conducts itself responsibly this can pass off as a minor aberration in our generation but if the society does not conduct itself prop, uh, responsibly this could become a major calamity of our generation in this you have all of us have a role to play but you have a significant role to play let us not create any doubts and uh, confusions in our mind at a point like this thank you uh, sadguru that was excellent very inspiring to put the dilemma at rest and uh, basically sonu what he sadguru said was to uh, bring home the point that we do not go for two months and overcome our our dilemma by action and risk taking thank you uh, sadguru i will now introduce you to uh, dr pramod avti 
he is associate professor in biophysics he has a strong interest uh, like i have in integrative medicine and also does a lot of computational uh, bioinformatics and biocomputing uh, dr pramod would you like to ask your question to uh, sadguru namaskaram sadguru ji namaskar my, my my privilege at this point of time being interacting with uh, you and uh, other team members of our institute uh my question would be at this point of stressful conditions and the fear both at the national as well as the global level what are the best methods which would make the healthcare professionals as well as other professionals globally because it is a challenge at this point of time that how and what the methods they can adopt to stay mentally strong as well as at the same time have the methods to improve the immunity well uh, about uh, mental strength this is something that human beings should strive for all their life when there is a crisis you seek mental strength then it will be far more challenging than building it through our life essentially instead of looking at it as mental strength let us look at it as simple balance all that needs to happen in a human being is just this if your thoughts and emotions are directed by you not in compulsive reaction to what's around you then staying in a balanced condition is not a problem right now for most human beings their mental state is in constant compulsive reaction to what is around them because of this they are going haywire it's not only now not because of the virus even otherwise when they had to go to work they were freaking about the work now they have to sit at home they're freaking about that tell me about what they are not complaining in their life just about everything but these challenging times really puts you to test and brings out the worst in some people but at the same time it brings out the best in most people you will see people will rise and do things that they wouldn't have done in normal times as things get tough you will see many human beings will rise and do the best possible things that they would have never thought of doing in their lives so that will also happen this will also happen so this is a choice that each individual each one of us have do we want to be a part of the problem or do we want to be a part of the solution this is all i beseech everyone you must be a part of the solution for medical personnel you know what to do all this stuff but for common people all i am saying is your business is to see that you don't get infected somehow just make sure you're not infected suppose beyond your care somehow it happened to you if it so happened you ensure nobody else gets it from you this much responsibility if everybody takes the work of the medical personnel will come down dramatically and it will come to a manageable level otherwise it will go to a place where we have to make ugly decisions already these things are happening well in italy they are ma making a judgement by age that is uh, who should get the treatment who should not get the treatment they are counting age and the number of years left in a person's life so uh, if it comes to sharing the ventilator between you and me you will get it i will go okay <laughs> i'm saying the these ugly decisions we will have to make between you and your mother if you have to share a ventilator you will get it and she will die these are ugly ugly things that should not happen in human life unfortunately we will dry, drive the situation there if we do not behave responsibly so uh, the leadership the prime minister continuously talking to the people trying to make them understand the significance but a few people including unfortunately in some parts of the world even medical professionals saying there is nothing to be done just get back to work let's see what happens what happens will not be a nice thing to see because the kind of situations we will ha have to handle will not be good at all for us about enhancing our immune system we have simple process we have very sophisticated complex processes to enhance your immune, immune system to uh, tell you in the last 39 years almost every day almost literally every day i have public engagements 
and I am traveling incessantly. In spite of that, I have not cancelled a single event yet because I am not well. That means my immune must be working pretty good with all the airplanes and the travel and the exposure to people, any number of infections you can… I am always in United States during the springtime. When uh, flu will be running all over the place, I am one of the few people who never takes a flu shot and never gets flu. One thing is being careful about things. Another thing is you must also make your immune system robust by the way you live. So those practices cannot be done now, but we have… we have very simple practices, twelve to twenty minute practices that people can do three to four times a day and enhance the immune system. If you wish, we will provide those videos for you. This uh, you can even… Uh, I don't know if there is some kind of uh, check to see whether it improves in a short span of time, but this will definitely enhance immune system. And another dimension of these practices is, suppose today you start the practice, next one week you're doing it well. Suddenly you find on the eighth day, you're not able to do it. This means you have some respiratory problem. It may not necessarily be uh, this particular virus, but in some way your respiratory system is not functioning at the full. So it is also kind of a test for an individual whether my respiration is happening well or is there an issue before the other symptoms show up. Already you know lungs are not functioning at their full capacity. So these practices can be given to common people, they can practice it at home without any risk. So such things can be given to enhance immune system and also like a check. About mental balance, it's very, very important that we understand we are the source. The source of human experience is within us. Whether we right now make ourselves fearful, agitated, balanced, tranquil, turmoil, joyful, miserable is entirely our making because the source of human experience is within us. It is coming from within us. What comes from within us must happen the way we want it. In challenging times, it becomes all the more important. Thank you, Sadhguru. I hope uh, this satisfied you, Dr. Pramod. Yes, I was, definitely. I was really inspired again. Not and me, but a like lot of, lot of uh, people. You want to say something, Dr. Pramod? No, no, I'm done with my question. So, uh, we would love to have Sadhguru's uh, blessing in uh, obtaining those protocols. And maybe in the healthcare workers, we could uh, circulate that and experience that. We have Dr. Grover and Dr. Bhalla who's already looking after the COVID uh, protocols. And uh, Sadhguru, would you also be open to us uh, experimenting with them, uh, given the regulatory approvals and the, uh, the tools, the molecular tools, the physiological tools and the psychological tools that we have uh, in collaboration with your institute? Definitely, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, one hundred percent we are open to those things. Uh, we had a discussion with a group of uh, doctors who've been working with us, a uh, few from India, rest from United States. Uh, this is being led by a, a particular anesthetologist from Harvard University who is uh, trying to lead this group. But what I see is that they all try to go by normal protocols which will take years of work. I think this is not a time for that. This uh, one simple process called Simha Kriya we will give, for which respiratory action will enhance itself and immune system will happen. I don't know how you will test it, but if you can just test ten people and see if there is improvement, I think without hesitation we must teach it to large number of people. Another thing is we will give you another k k process called Isha Kriya, which will bring mental balance and strength. You know, psychologically it will strengthen you in a certain way. These two things can be given. But we should not go by the normal protocols which will take years. Anything you say in United States research means they will say we will apply for funding, we will do this, we will do that. Those processes, this is not a time. At this time, we know by our experience it works. It works wonderfully well for me, it works for millions of people around us. So, but you need some kind of data, how to get to this data, how to arrive at this data, only you can decide I am not a qualified person or an expert in this field. But this much I know, it works for me. Yes. Uh, Sadhguru, I will now… Uh, I quickly ask Dr. Grover, have you uh, 
any additional question or uh, shall i take the questions from my other faculty colleagues dr bhuvan take question from other faculties all right so uh, sadguru uh, th these are the questions that we had with people who were with us there were other colleagues who couldn't make it because they were busy or they uh, they have sent those emails and whatsapp messages to me can i uh, read a few of them for uh, please. for you to please guide us so one of them is an extension of what you were just telling about the experimental part of it uh, do you think that apart from the nurses and the doctors duty to perform their uh, medical care and other things how do you envision the role of scientists uh, our honorable prime minister yesterday when he extended the lockdown he mentioned that he tried to push the scientists to come up with discoveries or a vaccine please work hard uh, would you like to uh, define that duty or uh, that uh, assignment would you like to reflect uh, on that definitely uh, if we come up with a vaccine it's wonderful but uh, i am not a medical expert but what i have seen in the last uh, uh, decade or more in united states is every year their uh, influenza virus keeps uh, mutating and modifying itself and every year they keeps keep up coming with a new vaccine within the first few days after the flu comes then a uh, new vaccine would have come up and they'll start uh, administering it to millions of people i don't know how that happens you must be able to tell me why how come they are able to come up with a vaccine for those viruses so quickly and what is the difficulty with this i do not understand that you must tell me but having said that my simple common sense thinks like this please tell me if i am wrong i could be wrong all i am saying is this virus die if it's on my hands if i wash with common soap the virus is dying that means some simple chemical in a soap that i use can kill this virus when it is so can't we come up with some kind of a medication that will kill it in my respiratory system is it so hard because right now i feel more than the more than the vaccine the treatment an effective treatment is more important because it's anyway going to spread so how to come up with that what is the science behind it i am not the person but my simple common sense uh, says this if soap can destroy virus how come we cannot destroy it in our lungs very nicely put i mean you have uh, actually raised a research question for us to apply for a grant the uh, dst department on science and technology has just asked just announced uh, a rapid fire uh, research proposals for a 6 months to 1 year period so i think it's good to uh, we will discuss after our discussion with you of how to devise a strategy to prevent it uh, or to ensure that this doesn't go infect the the body cells although a lot of research is now focused on developing immunity or vaccine or the sera of the recovered patients into uh, the people who are suffering so those approaches are already there but in terms of uh, the soap uh, analogy that you used i haven't had a, uh, i couldn't think about that so thank you for that also also one more thing that now one one uh, big dynamic that has risen now is that those who are infected and recovered and tested negative are again going into positive so this is a very complex dynamic that means this could uh, go through the entire humanity many times over in the next few years and by the time we vaccinate 7.6 first thing is to develop a vaccine and then to vaccinate this much population in the world is it looks very unrealistic for me so especially because it's going into relapse kind of infection to the same people uh, the present methods of what we are thinking or what we thought antibodies will develop in the body and uh, we will fight it the next time it won't come to us and also the other problem of some of the people that i know in uh, living in new york city they have been infected they have come out of it they have tested negative now but their respiratory action is not normal they are struggling uh, this is more than 6 weeks over after their infection is over in spite of that they are not at normal respiratory function so now if this happens across let's say half the population in the world that we get reduced in terms of our activity that risk is something that needs to be looked at scientifically 
Yes, Sadhguru. Uh, uh, but allow me to take this conversation a little uh, forward, although I'm skipping a question from my colleague, but I'll quickly come to that since you already inspired a scientist's curiosity. Uh, how do we deal with this problem of um, immunity on one hand and prevention uh, on the other hand? Uh, can we take uh, inspiration or guidance from our scriptures or the whether it is Chinese medicine or Indian system of medicine where there is a, a reference to Viparya where the cells of the body are not able to recognize who the enemies are and therefore the autoimmunity sets in such as diabetes and in fact uh, the enemies are not considered enemies so a coronavirus is not recognized by our immune system as a threat, as an enemy so it does not mount an antibody response so it's probably not able to kill it. Is it something that can be maneuvered by mind-body interaction, by pranayam or by sadhana or uh, what, uh, recently we had a, a, a consciousness meeting at 6 p.m. last evening. Uh, uh, of course, there has to be a scientific, it has to be reduced to cause-effect relationship. Has to be it has to be testable and scalable for everybody to benefit. But uh, would you like to reflect on the, the concept of Viparya um, or Panchkosha uh, well, uh, at a time like this, I wouldn't go for anything Chinese. <laughs> uh, so, uh, if you come into the yogic sciences, in the yogic sciences about how to make… See, fundamentally, the yogic sciences go from this. There is something called as Panchabhutas, the five elements which constitute our body and the universe around us. That is… Uh, I mean, I'll put it in English language, the earth, water, wind, fire and space. These five elements, how well balanced and how they function within us, will determine how healthy and well. We are not just thinking about health alone. Our idea of health is that you're not just medically healthy, you are at the peak of your performance, you are at the peak of your perception, because in yoga, the most important thing is to enhance your perception. If your perception has to be enhanced, your body should not be an issue. If you sit here, you should not even know that you have a body. If you become like that, only then you perceive things that other people do not perceive. If your body is so dense that you always feel it, that means your ability to perceive is greatly restricted. So having said that, to get the body to this stage, it means a certain level of purification, this is called as bhuta shuddhi, that is purifying the elements in the system. Based on this, there are various practices, but now teaching these very sophisticated practices to large number of people is an impossibility. It will need a certain level of commitment. But we have very simple practices which entire population can do without much instruction and uh, there is no danger of any side effects or harm or anything like that. So this is what I said, the Simha Kriya and Isha Kriya will give it to you in… But you are talking about six months, one… one year cycle of that, no. I would say in the next three days to six days, if you can ascertain that this is in some way even minutely beneficial, I think we should give it to people because at this time, this will make a big difference. Right now here in the yoga center, we are 2,642 people living here right now. Uh, about of… Uh, you know, the rest of the people are stuck in various cities around the world, they are not able to come back. And some of… Uh, you know, a certain number of volunteers are out there working in rural Tamil Nadu. But in this 2,642 people, not a single person has a cough or a cold, not even forget about the COVID, even normal cough or cold, everybody is perfectly healthy, simply because of the daily practice that they do. And the amount of work that we turn out in a day, we are all like eighteen hours work schedules, seven days, three hundred sixty-five days, this is how we always live. So obviously our systems are functioning at a higher level. Can we teach everybody this process right now? No. It is too sophisticated, it takes a lot of instruction and understanding. But the simple practices, how to evaluate this, not going by the normal medical pro protocols because that's going to take long time, you as doctors and scientists, if you can arrive at a simple way of evaluating, okay, it is doing this, so this must have this kind of impact. 
Uh, we have some uh, tests done by California… University of California. This is uh, in 2010, that's ten years now. They're still evaluating it, they've still not, uh, you know, interpreted what is the thing. The sum of the B BDNF factors that… Uh, that they've noticed, they say we've never seen anything like this. But for interpretation, they need another grant that's not happened, so it is right there. <laughs> Like they, it is… it's all the… this thing, if you want, I will send you all the results, what they have found by the practice. But it's not been interpreted, it has not been translated. One important thing they say is the proteins needed for regeneration of the neurons in the brain. It is increased by two hundred and forty-one percent. That means the brain, as you age, it can rejuvenate and become better than to deplete as it normally does. So, but interpretation doesn't happen after ten years, it's still going on. It's worse than bureaucracy, the whole process. So, let's not get into that right now, if we come out with something that is useful for the country and the world, it'll be great if the scientists can break the normal pro protocols and mindsets and arrive at… If something is not damaging, but it's beneficial by ten percent, we must administer it right now, because that's… that is the kind of action that we need in the country. Yes. Thank you, Sadhguru. Uh, this takes us to another question that one of my uh, professor, a lady professor asked. Uh, she's an ENT surgeon. Uh, she wants, she's very keen on understanding the trends in these patients which, which are coming up as COVID patients, whether they are associated with diabetes, hypertension, which drugs are working. They talk of uh, hydrochlorine, uh, chloroquine, and uh, those kind of studies require uh, regulatory approvals or what are called as the ethical approvals. Normally, as you uh, just now said, uh, it's a long-term process and the approvals also take time. So, uh, would you like to uh, uh, guide us or reflect on uh, whether it is ethical to uh, go ahead and take the patient's informed consent and do a limited study on these patients to evolve a therapy or to diagnose a trend, to be able to prevent it, to be able to uh, reduce the havoc that might uh, come very shortly, or, or, or should, if we go through the ethical approval, it may it may take time and it may prolong, uh, and it may be too late. So there is this ethics part, which comes in the uh, discharge of our duty as a scientist or as an investigator or the researcher. Would you like to comment on that? See, the only ethic uh, that should be uh, for a doctor and for everybody is how to save a life. Ethics have been made so that misuse doesn't happen. Ethics have not been made to impede solutions in life. So if you're finding a solution, if your ethics are impeding a solution, what is the point of that? Yes, we should take that. Am I an authority to say this? No, I am not an authority. But right now, uh, certain things have been done in United States. They have allowed uh, car manufacturing companies to produce medical equipment. They cleared it on an emergency level. So if you went with a normal process, this licensing process would take uh, five, six years probably. It's been just done like that. Is it ethical or not? To save a life is a very ethical thing to do. To allow a life to perish because of some values and morals that we have in our head is not a good thing to do. About these diabetics or uh, people with hypertension or various uh, HIV uh, people who definitely are uh, at… Uh, you know, are under threat for this and also uh, age group, you know, the vulnerable age group which is there. See how we understand this in yoga, see if it's of any use to you, let me put this across to you. See, the body is run by five main uh, compositions of mm, the different types of prana. This is called as pranavayu, samanavayu, apanavayu, udhana and vyana. The things that you mentioned in the form of diabetes, blood pressure and various other things, particularly diabetes is, it destroys or reduces what is called as the vyana prana. Vyana prana is in charge of your uh, preservation. The cellular preservation is mainly done by vyana prana. So if vyana prana gets reduced, 
you become available to all kinds of things. This is not necessarily directly communi uh, connected with the immune system per se, because we don't see it like that. The yogic system does not think of immune system. Yogic system sees that every cell in the body wants to live. Every cell in this body is programmed for health and well-being, but sometimes they fail. Sometimes they themselves work against that. Like uh, every person in this country is supposed to be interested in the well-being of this country, but many times either out of ignorance or because of certain intent, we start working against our own country. Just like that, the cells in the body can work against us, but fundamentally this is because the Vyana Prana has become low. When the Vyana Prana becomes low, the preservative instinct in the cellular level comes down considerably and becomes available to various other possibilities of infections and whatever else. So, if this is of any use to you, we can list out all the things which reduces Vyana Prana. Those things, I don't know if you will confirm it as redu reduction of uh, immune system or not, but where Vyana Prana is low, naturally they become susceptible to various things. Thank you, uh, Sadhguru, for uh, uh, really putting things in perspective. In fact, that brings me to uh, my favorite question, also aired by Dr. Pramod, is, is this the right time? Is this the correct situation when we need to bring in the Vyana Prana knowledge, the Vedas, the Ayurveda knowledge, the yoga knowledge, uh, and combine it with the modern medicine? And because we have an untreatable dis disease and many untreatable diseases might come, uh, the non-communicable diseases, Dr. Sonu will agree, he works on uh, the public front, uh, have no cure, diabetes otherwise has no cure, it is pretty much management based, Alzheimer has no cure and hypertension also more or less is controlled by antihypertensives but uh, you can still halt the conversion of prehypertensives to hypertensives by just lifestyle modification. So is this the right time Sadhguru uh, that we bring in? the best of the East with the best of the West. If so, how to model this into our healthcare system, into PGI, into All India Institute, into NIMHANS. NIMHANS already has it, in fact, I was told. So what is in your way, in your idea, the best model uh, that may uh, propel uh, the entire system in, you know, align ourselves to this? Uh, definitely, this is a best time to consider that but I don't think this is the best time to implement that because right now we are on a emergency function kind of thing. All of you will get ten times busier than what you are right now in the next month <laughs> It is going to happen one way or the other because we are such a dense population, I don't believe any fanciful ideas that we will be able to control this. We have successfully slowed it down, which is a great thing. This is only buying time. We are only buying time to prepare ourselves to be able to handle this better. This is not the time to go into those things, but this is definitely the time to bring about simple practices which will enhance these dimensions within us and uh, also keep a kind of a watch on what kind of results it produces. If the results are substantial, then studies and, uh, you know, integrating these systems into modern medicine, this is… these are long-term efforts, this cannot be done in a situation like this, where day-to-day -day you will be fighting with a life-and-death situation for thousands of people. At this time you cannot, but this is a time definitely to teach some simple practice, large-scale and see what impact it has, not as a study, but to save lives and uh, make… help people recover from whatever has happened to them. Thank you, Sadhguru. Uh, my professor in anesthesia, she wants to, she wanted to ask this question but which you already partly answered but I will still uh, uh, pose it to you on our behalf. She wants to know if, as you also projected, if the situation really gets worse, then uh, she and her colleagues may have a similar situation where they may have to choose whom to give the ventilator, the young versus the old, as it happened as we saw in Italy and some European countries. And there is a deficiency of ventilator, to which you alluded by saying that the car company was asked to make ventilators in the U.S. as well. How do we, how do we address this? You uh, partly addressed that question, but would you like to expand that on it a little bit more? 
you know, this is a terrible choice that sometimes human beings have to make. Uh, as all of you know, by being doctors, mm, you know, when wars happen, those uh, military doctors decide these things, whether to cut off somebody's leg or not, whether to let somebody die or not. Because you are not trained to let somebody die, you are trained to see how life can be revived. But making this… making this decision that we will let somebody die is not an easy decision to make because uh, an age factor or something else is a very ugly way of making this decision. But is there a perfect way of making this decision? No. We should ensure that we are not pushed into that place where we have to make such decisions. But if it comes, we will have to make such very ugly decisions which will live with us as a generation of people, it will live with us for our life when we make such decisions. These are challenging times. Uh, it's very unfortunate, but it is there. If we can take some uh, inspiration from… Uh, you might have heard of uh, people bifurcating and, you know, using… Uh, dividing the ventilator into four or five… Yes, uh, or uh, see, all those jugads can be done and ventilator, as far as I can see, uh, I, please tell me if I'm wrong. I see it's a simple uh, instrument which has to be in rhythm with the, you know, our respiratory action and pump in oxygen and take out the carbon dioxide, which is not such a complex machinery, which is not such a great technology as far as I'm concerned. Definitely innovations can be made quickly uh, and uh, these things can be done. And probably I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, it's <laughs> as I talk about this since uh, uh, like before I came here, I was just looking at what is a ventilator. Probably we can devise, I can easily design if somebody can execute this, a ventilator which will work for hundred people at a time. It can be done because it may not be a perfect ventilator adjusted to you know, sophisticated adjustment to a particular person's breathing, but it will be a crude ventilator which will serve this purpose and save lives at this time. Uh, like you can have one big machine which just pumps in at the same level, which may not be the best way of doing in normal circumstances, but these are not normal circumstances, we must be ready for all that. So we will we need to bring… Uh, make necessity as the mother of invention and bring out new innovations, as you said. Uh, Sadhguru, uh, there's a professor of psychology in my institute and he wanted to ask a simple question, how to deal with the over expectations of the public or the people from our health workers, uh, especially doctors? Should we deal with it? Should we worry about it? How do we… No, you must uh, leave that for the managers of, uh, <laughs> you know, political leaders and other uh, bureaucratic leaders, they must manage those things. You will have enough to do with the medical training that you have. That must be put to be uh, good use. I don't expect doctors to manage the society. Managing the society should be done by political leaders, bureaucrats and others. Uh, all of us, we will pitch in to see that the public doesn't uh, harass you uh, out of their confusions, whatever they have and their concerns for their loved ones and, you know, reactions in the society. This the doctor should not worry about, somebody else should manage this, doctors should focus on their medical training and see how we can minimize the loss of life in this entire episode. Yeah. I have my last question, but may I would like to give an opportunity to Dr. Pramod if you… Uh, if something is bubbling in your head and you are wanting to ask something, otherwise I will. Yeah, most of the uh, questions have uh, come across. So, uh, I, I guess most of the uh, questions have been uh, very well addressed by Sadhguruji and uh, we, we really thank you for that. Sonu, would you like to ask any question? Uh, I think I equal the thought of uh, uh, Dr. Pramod that uh, I think I have many questions in my mind initially, but uh, <clears throat> on listening to Sadhguruji over a period of uh, almost uh, 40 minutes now, so most of my queries are address, uh, addressed and I think the best part which uh, uh, I like is like bringing best 
among the people in these worst situations. So I think uh, this is really true, and uh, we are engaging in tobacco as a as a tobacco control expert. So tobacco cessation was the most difficult thing, and now, uh, like uh, I am imagining that uh, the people are not getting tobacco, and uh, and they are they are used to having good practices, and now the best thing is coming out of them. So thank you, uh, thank you, Sudhruji. Very nicely, uh, very nice thoughts. Uh, then I will, uh, unless uh, Sadhguru wants to respond to that, I can come to the last question uh, with your permission. Uh, yes. And the last question is uh, a question which is removed from the current uh, circumstances. It's more about yoga and something that we as yoga researchers, uh, me, Pramod, and about seven, eight faculty members in PGI are very actively working on the yoga and meditation front using the sophisticated molecular tools. And a question that always rages our mind is, and people ask us, uh, how is yoga different from physical exercise? So, <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people just take it as an exercise with some home and some uh, breathing in, breathing out, uh, aligned to certain poses. So I would like uh, to request you on behalf of our seven, eight faculty members of PGI who are working at yoga and meditation uh, to uh, enlighten us on this. So, uh, <laughs> what, what is yoga? Well, uh, because today uh, most people know the yoga, which is uh, a rebound from the American coast. And a lot of people think uh, Madonna invented yoga. So, <laughs> because of that, there are all kinds of misunderstandings. The word yoga means union. Union between what and what? Essentially, as you sit here, you and me, both of us are breathing, for sure. But we have an individual experience. We have to breathe, we have to uh, drink water, we have to eat food, otherwise this cannot survive. This is constantly in transaction with everything else to exist. But we have an individual experience. Because of this individual experience, most human beings have taken this individual experience rather too seriously and they think they're all by themselves. Because of that, there is so much suffering, so much confusion, so much nonsense, everything happening. As I touched this aspect earlier, all human experience is coming from within us. What is coming from within us, if it is not happening the way you want it, obviously, Every faculty that you have is out of control. Having all faculties out of control and hoping to live well is a stupid idea, it's never going to work. It doesn't matter how much education we have, how much wealth we have, how much uh, whatever else arrangements we have, technologies we have, we will not live well because if what is coming from within us is not coming the way we want, how will we manage the entire world to happen our way? It's never going to happen. So, having said that, the word yoga means union. That means this unity that we have with the existence, that right now the whole existence is supporting us to sit here on this little planet which is spinning in the middle of nowhere. And here we are sitting, talking, we are very thrilled that we come up with this technology. What is this? Is this on Zoom or Google? What is this? Skype. Skype. We are very excited that we invented this Skype and now you and me, you're in Punjab, I'm in Tamil Nadu, we can talk to each other, we are very excited about this. But in the middle of this endless cosmos, literally beginningless and endless cosmos, we are sitting on a small mud ball of a planet and something is holding all of us together, the planet together, the, uh, the planetary system together, galaxies together and making it work. And we are part of this existence, but that fantastic and phenomenal experience is not there in most human beings. Yoga means to come to that experience where you are an integrated life with everything else. So your individuality is just a magnanimity of the creation that it's given you an individual experience. So how does one come to this? I will make a very simplistic uh, projection if you find holes in it please uh, ask a question because uh, when you try to make a, 
a very complex aspect in a simplistic answer, there will be holes in it. But if you don't pick any holes, I'll be happy <laughs> It's like this, for example, there is… see, you and me know that we have a body only because there is sensation in the body. If there's no sensation, we wouldn't know. But if we just rub our hands like this for ten seconds and hold it like this, three, four inches away, you can do it right now and see, it happens, it works even for doctors. <laughs> if you hold it uh, three inches away now and close your eyes, you will see some kind of sensation is happening between the two. Is that so? So, yeah. so if there is simply vigorous activity or an exuberant energy within you, suddenly your sensory body expands. What this means is, see right now there is water in this vessel. This is definitely not you, but if you drink it, it becomes you. All that happened for this water is, what was outside the boundaries of sensation, came into the boundaries of sensation, suddenly you experience this as myself. That's how you gathered this body. What was outside as food yesterday has become you today. What was food yesterday was day before yesterday, just earth. Earth became food, food became you. And one day you will become the earth once again and that's what we are struggling to prevent right now <laughs> with all this COVID. What is the threat? The threat is we may become earth once again. Yes, that's all the thing is. So, right now, if you sit here, if your sensory body expands, because anything that is within your sensory experience, you think is you. Anything outside your sensory body right now, you think is not you. If you touch your left hand with your right hand, you clearly know this is you. But if you touch the chair upon which you're sitting, you know it's not you, simply because there is no sensation there. So if your sensory body expanded, let's say right now, to cover the room in which you're sitting, let's say ten other people are there in your room, now you will experience these ten people and everything as a part of yourself because your sensory body has expanded. So suppose some… you had to amputate somebody, it is a known fact that even if the leg is gone, still the sensory experience of the leg can be there for some time, it's called the phantom leg or whatever. I thought you are neurological person, right? You're a neuroscience. So there is a sensory existence to the body beyond the physical body. It is right now hosted in the physical body, but sensory body is independent of the physical body, you can enlarge it. So the entire yogic process is like this. If you make your life energies highly exuberant within you, very active and exuberant, your sensory body will be larger. If your sensory body becomes as large as the universe, you will experience the whole universe as yourself. Then we say you are a yogi because Yogi does not mean you're doing yoga. Yogi means you have experienced the union of the existence. In your living experience, as you experience the ten fingers of your hands, you are experiencing everything around you as yourself. Once… once even for a moment, if you experience everything around you, the world around you as yourself, after that you don't need any morality, you don't need any values, you don't need any ethics because you don't need any values and ethics with yourself. You… nobody told you this little finger is a helpless finger, don't protect it, don't cut it off. Nobody tells you such morals because you will protect anything and everything that you experience as yourself, there is a natural instinct of taking care of that. So this is what yoga means, to bring this living experience to you that everything around you is yourself. Now. The, the idea is, on the way there are many benefits, health will happen naturally, a joyfulness will happen, peacefulness… that is what is the marketing part of yoga. You will become peaceful, you can become joyful, you can become healthy, but we shouldn't get lost in it because what will you do with a healthy life? I'm asking because there are more people living on this planet who are healthy and miserable rather than unhealthy and miserable. At least if they're unhealthy, there's good enough reason, there's an excuse for misery. But most of the miserable people are actually healthy, isn't it? Unfortunately, once you're… once you're… 
once you are ill with something, you have good reason to be miserable. But uh, most healthy people are miserable for nothing. Right now, a whole lot of people were miserable going to work. Now, the government says, stay at home, we will still make sure you get your salary, but they're extremely miserable because they're staying at home. So, just look at the life, the way we are arranging it, even the fundamental faculties are not working for us. If our thought and our emotion took instructions from us, being joyful, loving, wonderful is a natural outcome. This is not a height of achievement, this is how you were when you were as a child. Say, people are thinking to be peaceful, joyful and loving is an achievement. No, this is how you were when you were five years of age, it's the square one of your life. Getting back to square one is not an achievement, but unfortunately everybody thinks it's an achievement. Very, very nicely explained. I was… Uh, I had my goosebumps. And uh, with that, we thank you from our journal Integrative Medicine Case Reports, which is edited at PGI, my faculty colleagues. We were really excited and uh, I think we will take back uh, my colleague with colleagues this very uh, important message and wisdom and uh, be able to do better research, better healthcare provision for the people who need it. And with that, we also thank some, most importantly Sadhguru for sparing the time to come with us, to interact with us. This is really joyful and this is the best thing that happened to my lockdown at least. <laughs> whatever that uh, <laughs> we've been going in between to yeah. work. Please feel free to, uh, you know, demand anything from us. Whatever we can do to enhance and serve the medical community right now in these very challenging times, we are willing to do. I will ask them to send these two uh, simple kriyas, one for the mind and one for the body. Uh, among yourself, you practice and see if it works, you can further push it around. Please, you must come and visit the ashram after this is over <laughs> <laughs> We would like to come and visit… Uh, and also about the studies, uh, I was just thinking about this. If… Uh, yeah. if your normal protocols can be broken, we can send you blood samples or, uh, you know, sputum samples or whatever it takes to come to a quick… Uh, quick conclusion that people who are doing these practices have a better immune system or whatever. If you can come to that, yeah. I think it'll be extremely useful right now for the entire mm -hmm. world, not just for India. Yeah. Me and Pramod will sit together and have a research question put in paper and we'll send it to you. And uh, we have, Sadhguru, you'll be happy to know that we are taking these uh, experimental details to even uh, cell culture experiments. So, for example, a person who does yoga, we take the blood out and grow the cells in that blood of a yogi. I'm just giving you an idea which is probably not anyone. In, am I right, Pramod? I don't think anybody yes. has published this, this idea. And see how these cells from the yogis or the blood-derived sera uh, in uh, from the yogis can uh, stimulate cell proliferation and stem cell population versus those derived from a regular uh, non-yoga practitioner. So these kind of ideas and systems we already have in place, and we are working on a working on a uh, array of ex uh, subjects in yoga and meditation from high altitude to diabetic yoga protocol implementation to common yoga protocol implementation and studying their efficacy. Also looking at heart rate variability, you mentioned the gene expression changes that you alluded to when you mentioned BDNF in Harvard, that person who's working on that. So we definitely look forward to um, um, a sustainable and uh, learning uh, interaction with your uh, with your team and to be able to see you physically when you come to the ashram. Yes, you should come. You must come all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.